This is the United States as we know it today. The most powerful country in the world. A country that captivates as much through its culture as through its technological achievements. It is a reality that may seem persistent. This is the reality without any other alternative. But reality is merely the outcome of the sequence of improbable events from the past. Britain emerged from the Seven Years' War in debt and, in search of money, was forced in the 1760s to impose a series of taxes on its colonies. Thirteen colonies in North America rebelled against this injustice and waged war on the English until they declared their independence on July 4, 1776. It was unlikely that in less than 100 years, these thirteen colonies would become a world power. Yet. The actions of rebellious enslaved Africans led first by Toussaint Louverture and then John Jacques de Saline on a small island in the Caribbean will facilitate the chain of events that will allow the tremendous expansion of the United States of America. On the night of August 14, 1791, at Bois Cayman in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, enslaved blacks participated in a secret religious ceremony presided over by Diddy Bookman, a slave from Jamaica, and Celine Fatimon, a mixed-race mambo, during which they planned a large-scale revolt. By August 22, Saint-Domingue was a battleground with different factions vying for control over the colony. At this time, Toussaint Louverture, formerly enslaved, turned skilled military leader, began to rise through the ranks due to his tactical abilities, leadership, and diplomatic competencies. Initially fighting for the Spanish against the French, Toussaint switched sides in May 1794 after the French government officially abolished slavery. This was a strategic move that enabled him to gain the support of the formerly enslaved population. From 1794 to 1798, with his new French alliance, Toussaint fought and chased the Spanish and the British, who had invaded Saint-Domingue in 1793. Despite the French alliance, he acted with considerable autonomy, consolidating power and implementing his policies, such as restoring plantation discipline and labor. He thus succeeded in gradually diminishing the influence of France in the colony, although Saint-Domingue remained, on paper, a French territory. In 1799, a civil war known as the War of Knives erupted between Toussaint Louverture and his mulatto rival André Rigo, who controlled the south of Saint-Domingue. Toussaint emerged victorious by July 1800, effectively bringing all of Saint-Domingue under his control. Having solidified control in Saint-Domingue, Toussaint turned his attention to the eastern part of Hispaniola, the actual Dominican Republic. The Treaty of Basel, signed in 1795, ended the conflict between Spain and France and ceded the eastern part of Hispaniola to France. However, the French authorities were slow to take actual control. Santo Domingo was still controlled by a Spanish administration. In January 1801, without France's consent, Toussaint invaded the territory, taking control by March. His successful invasion was part of his vision for a unified and autonomous island free from foreign interference and the threat of slavery. In July 1801, Toussaint enacted a constitution for Saint-Domingue which named him Governor General for life and provided for eventual independence and an end to slavery. 
Although the Constitution acknowledged French sovereignty, it demonstrated that he was the absolute master of the colony. Even though Toussaint Louverture succeeded in taking control of Saint-Domingue at the expense of the French, his authority was, to some extent, accepted by the metropolis, which after the French Revolution was won by Jacobinism. However, after the 1799 coup d'état in France, power lay between the hands of the consulate, with Napoleon Bonaparte as the first consul and de facto the real ruler. Bonaparte, although pro-Jacobin at the beginning of his military career, did not share the progressive ideas of the French Revolution, especially regarding slavery. Before he came to power, the directory that ruled France, in the context of the war against the British, was planning to invade Jamaica using the help of Toussaint Louverture. Bonaparte, at the beginning, embraced this idea. He even prepared a letter to send to Toussaint saying, train and organize the National Guard and the troops of the line. I hope the time is not far distant when an army from Saint-Domingue will be able to contribute to the extension of French possessions and glory in your part of the world. Bonaparte will never send this letter to Toussaint. The rise to power of this black general and his obvious ambitions made him see Toussaint as an adversary and not as an ally. Toussaint had taken the eastern part of Hispaniola when he had explicitly asked him not to. He also saw the constitution promulgated by Toussaint as an insult. He ended up taking sides with the lobby of French planters who had seen their essential source of wealth provided by Saint-Domingue disappear. Indeed, the harsh slavery system in Saint-Domingue before 1791 allowed for unparalleled sugar and coffee production. It was the colony that brought the most income to its metropolis compared to other colonies. Saint-Domingue alone produced 40% of France's exports. The slave revolt put a stop to this inhuman exploitation. Bonaparte wanted to restore it. However, he saw this restoration of the old system in a much more grandiose setting which better suited his megalomania. He dreamed of a self-sufficient French empire in America. While Saint-Domingue produced a lot of sugar and coffee, it relied on the outside to supply it with foodstuffs for the subsistence of its inhabitants. And given France's inability to send enough merchant fleets to meet the colony's needs, the colonists traded extensively with the English. And this was a practice that Toussaint continued by establishing trade agreements with England and the United States. So Bonaparte wanted to restore slave sugar production in Saint-Domingue, but also make sure to keep commercial exclusivity with the island. To do this, he was going to use Louisiana, a large territory in North America that became French after a secret agreement was signed with Spain in October 1800. Louisiana would produce foodstuffs, especially wheat, to feed the sugar-producing colonies, such as Saint-Domingue, Guadeloupe, and Martinique. The plan to get rid of Toussaint Louverture was also facilitated by the peace talks between France and England. Bonaparte had a freer hand to send large troops for his expedition. And when the French began to evoke their intention to restore their authority in Saint-Domingue, the English showed themselves favorable to this idea because the revolt of the slaves of Saint-Domingue was a bad example and a threat to the economic model which ensured the prosperity of all the great powers involved in the slave trade and the exploitation of the labor force of Africans. Bonaparte also had to rely on another ally in his quest to re-establish French authority in Saint-Domingue, Thomas Jefferson, the new American president. In July 1801, the Chargy d'Affair, Louis-André Pichon, met with Jefferson to have the support of the United States against Toussaint. As with England, France had now better relations with the United States after the quasi-war period of 1797 to 1801 when Americans and French clashed in naval combat in the Caribbean. Also, like England, the United States saw the Saint-Domingue slave revolt as a bad example for its own enslaved Africans. Already in Virginia, former slave Gabriel Prosser had planned a revolt inspired by the success of the blacks of Saint-Domingue and Jefferson himself was very alarmist about the news coming out of Saint-Domingue. He anticipated that Toussaint Louverture would declare Hispaniola's independence to create an outlaw nation of savages who might even attack them to free slaves. 
Toussaint's capture of the eastern part of the island enriched the American imagination with the fear of a possible unleashed African Republic a few kilometers from their coast. Although Jefferson agreed with France restoring the balance of power in the region, he warned Pichon that the United States had very lucrative commercial activities with the island and would like to keep these exchanges with a possible future French administration. Indeed, Saint-Domingue was very dependent on the United States for its supply. And what was implied in France's approach in seeking the support of the United States was that during the military operations of Bonaparte's men on the island, the Americans were going to supply the ports controlled by the French and would desert the ports controlled by Toussaint to starve the rebels. However, the attitude of Thomas Jefferson will gradually change regarding Bonaparte's plans. Rumors that France had secretly acquired Louisiana from Spain were confirmed. Also, Jefferson began to receive reports, and particularly that of his minister in Great Britain, Rufus King, that the objective of Bonaparte was not only to restore the French hegemony in Saint-Domingue and Guadeloupe, but also to take possession of Louisiana, and particularly of New Orleans. New Orleans, located at the mouth of the Mississippi River, allowed American farmers and merchants from the vast interior territories to transport their goods, especially agricultural products such as cotton, corn, and wheat, to a major port for export. Once the goods arrived in New Orleans, they could be easily loaded and shipped to markets around the world. The early 19th century saw a boom in American agriculture in the territories west of the Appalachians. The ease of transporting these agricultural products down the Mississippi to New Orleans, rather than over the mountains to eastern ports, made New Orleans crucial to the American economy. New Orleans was a sticking point. Jefferson had to say, there is on the globe one single spot, the possessor of which is our natural and habitual enemy. It is New Orleans. With Spain as a neighbor, the Americans felt more secure, as Spain had become weak and no longer had imperialist ambitions. Unlike Bonaparte's France, Jefferson, although a Francophile, did not trust Napoleon Bonaparte who was obviously an authoritarian megalomaniac who will practice exclusive trade and who could invade their territory at any time. Faced with the Bonaparte threat, the possible independence of the blacks of Saint-Domingue becomes the lesser evil. Jefferson even began to speak well of Toussaint Louverture's management of the island. In a letter to Governor James Monroe of Virginia, he asserted that the blacks of Saint-Domingue had established themselves into a de facto sovereignty and have organized themselves under regular laws and government. And when Jefferson learned of the magnitude of the French Armada, it was clear that Bonaparte had hidden agendas. Under the command of Bonaparte's brother-in-law, General Charles Leclerc, the expedition comprised a massive force of around 30,000 soldiers. A considerable naval flotilla accompanied the expedition, consisting of numerous warships, frigates, and other vessels. 3,500 men under the orders of General Antoine Richepence will also be dispatched to Guadeloupe, where the actions of Battalion Commander Louis Delbers also threatened the authority of France. Bonaparte instructed Leclerc to disarm the rebels of Saint-Domingue and arrest their leaders, restore white hegemony, and re-establish slavery and the exclusivity system. After the order would be restored to the island, which Bonaparte estimated would take only six weeks, Leclerc was instructed to proceed to New Orleans to take possession of Louisiana and establish French authority there. This whole plan was, of course, kept secret. Even the planters who lobbied for the old regime were unaware that Bonaparte intended to restore slavery. Bonaparte had promised Toussaint that he would protect the freedom of former slaves, but Toussaint Louverture was not fooled. This is why when Leclerc's men arrived on the coast of Saint-Domingue in January 1802, Toussaint and his fellows like Jean-Jacques de Salines, Jacques Maurepas, Henri Christophe, and La Plume were ready for war. However, despite the courageous resistance of the rebels, the French captured one after the other the main towns and ports of the colony. Cap Francais, Fort Dauphin, Port-au-Prince, Gonaves, and Saint-Marc all fell into the hands of Leclerc's men. As resources dwindled, rebel-controlled areas shrank, leading to decreased morale. 
Christophe, Dessalines, and then Toussaint surrendered. Toussaint was placed under house arrest but regained his rank and properties by Leclerc. By early May 1802, stability returned to the island, trade resumed in ports, and the subdued rebels retained their lands and ranks. Despite being under house arrest, Toussaint continued to write to his men and ask them to be ready. Toussaint was invited to discuss with Leclerc, but saw himself being arrested and put on a ship for France. Before leaving, on June 12, 1802, he said these words, which will remain famous in history, in overthrowing me, you have cut down in Saint Domingue only the trunk of the tree of liberty, it will spring up again from the roots, for they are numerous and they are deep. Toussaint was imprisoned in France where, at the age of 59, he will die of pneumonia in the harsh cold of Fort de Joux in the Jura Mountains on April 7, 1803. Antoine Richepin's men in Guadeloupe also had a similar victory. After the suicide of Louis Delgers and 300 of his men on May 28, 1802, French authority was reestablished on the island. But Richepin's, who goes too quickly, restored slavery in Guadeloupe. In St. Domingue, the news of the restoration of slavery in Guadeloupe revived the spirit of revolt of the blacks, who knew they could not trust the French. Leclerc's attempt to disarm the rebels backfired, aggravating tensions. Black generals like Dessalines and Christophe, who had calmed down, resumed the rebellion. Mulatto officers like André Rigaud, Alexander Pechin, and Jean-Pierre Boyer, who Toussaint had exiled after the War of the Knives, were recruited by Bonaparte and were part of the Leclerc expedition. But they suffered the racism of the white French troops, especially from the second of Leclerc, the General Donatien de Rochambeau, who was as brutal against the blacks as the mulattoes. Rigaud was forced to leave the island. The mulattoes then understood that white hegemony would not serve their interests and joined the rebellion under the leadership of Jean-Jacques de Salines. And de Salines will shine as a relentless leader. Freedom or death became the motto of the reinvigorated revolution. The blacks were ready to die in battle rather than return to slavery. The French soldiers fell like flies in fighting and the towns gradually returned to the rebels' authority. Also, an epidemic of yellow fever ravaged the ranks of the French, who had no immune protection against this tropical disease. Leclerc was in panic mode, having already lost more than 20,000 of his men. In October 1802, he wrote to Bonaparte advocating for a war of extermination, we must destroy all the blacks of the mountains, men and women, and spare only children under 12 years of age. We must destroy half of those in the plains and must not leave a single colored person in the colony who has worn an epaulet. He also asked for 30,000 additional soldiers and added in his letter to Bonaparte, if you cannot send the troops I demand, the colony will be forever lost. Leclerc died the following month, suffering from yellow fever. Eventually, 20,000 additional soldiers from France arrived in Saint-Domingue in January 1803. These will be the last reinforcements that France will send to the rebel colony. When Bonaparte was informed of the death of his brother-in-law, he knew that Saint-Domingue was a lost cause. Meanwhile, in the United States and New Orleans, the situation was getting worse. New Orleans, which the French had not yet taken over, was still administered by the Spanish. The Spanish administrator Juan Ventura Morales decided to revoke the right of deposit. The right of deposit allowed American farmers to store their goods in New Orleans without paying customs duties. Farmers in the western states that bordered the Mississippi and depended on the port of New Orleans were furious. The revocation threatened the economic livelihood of these settlers. The issue was so vital that some even suggested that the western territories might have to secede from the U.S. and align with a foreign power to ensure their economic interests. Others were considering war. President Jefferson was deeply concerned about the situation. Although he also thought war was an option to deal with the crisis, he still wanted to settle the problem using diplomacy. And learning of the debacle of the expedition of Leclerc in Saint-Domingue, he knew that this gave him time to discuss with the French, who will no longer be able to take New Orleans anytime soon. So, 
Jefferson dispatched James Monroe to Paris in January 1803 with an offer to buy New Orleans. Monroe was to join the U.S. Minister to France, Robert Livingston, in these negotiations. The U.S. was initially prepared to spend up to $10 million just for New Orleans and, possibly, parts of Florida. While the U.S. envoys were prepared to negotiate for New Orleans, Napoleon Bonaparte's priorities were shifting. Tensions between France and Britain were on the rise again, and Bonaparte desperately needed money to finance this inevitable war with the English. Saint-Domingue was practically lost, and without Saint-Domingue, Louisiana was useless. The cash cow was Saint-Domingue. The role of the lands of Louisiana was to feed the cash cow. Bonaparte saw no point in defending this North American territory which could easily fall into the hands of the English coming from Canada. He, therefore, preferred to cede this territory of 2,144,520 square kilometers or 828,000 square miles to the Americans for the modest sum of $15 million. This vast expanse of land stretched from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains and from the Gulf of Mexico to the Canadian border. The American negotiators who only wanted New Orleans were stunned by this offer, undoubtedly the best land deal in history. Monroe, without even waiting for Jefferson's authorization, hastens to accept the offer before Bonaparte changes his mind. He signed the treaty on April 30th. Jefferson became aware of the deal in early July 1803, and it was then submitted to the U.S. Senate for ratification later that month. The Senate approved the treaty on October 20, 1803, and the United States formally took possession of the Louisiana Territory in December 1803. Thus, without even shedding a drop of blood, the United States overnight doubled the size of its territory. Meanwhile, in Saint-Domingue, the rebels on November 18, 1803, had just fought their last battle in Vertier, where Rochambeau, who had succeeded Leclerc, would finally concede the defeat of France. On January 1, 1804, Saint-Domingue, which became Haiti, declared its independence with Jean-Jacques de Saline as its head of state. Exiled to the island of St. Helene from 1815 to 1821, Napoleon will express regrets. One of the greatest mistakes I ever made, and that I still regret, was to send an army to St. Domingue, he confessed. If I had used an army of free blacks with French officers, it would have done indescribable damage to the English. I would have taken Jamaica, and their other colonies would have been compromised. The rebels of Haiti, fighting for their freedom without knowing it, allowed the Americans to change their course in the history of the world. The purchase fundamentally transformed the way Americans perceived themselves. The vast open spaces of the Louisiana Territory attracted immigrants from all over Europe, changing the character of the nation by increasing its social diversity. The drive to colonize this new territory has shifted the country's eyes westward, making further expansion almost inevitable and giving birth, if not to the term, at least to the forces behind Manifest Destiny the idea that the United States had both a right and a duty to own and settle the entire continent. Before the Louisiana Purchase, Americans in many ways still had a colonial attitude, they still looked to England and France. With the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory, their focus shifted to their own continent. For the first time, Americans became Americans as we know them, people with a continental view. It is hard to imagine that the 13 colonies which rebelled against England would have become a world power without their conquest of the West. And it's fascinating to realize that the Haitian Revolution, led by former enslaved people who were despised and dehumanized, and pursuit of their right to exist, was a catalyst for this pivotal moment that will change the history of the world forever. Unfortunately, their exploit, far from being seen by their contemporaries as a light on the altar of humanity, will instead be a threat to the interests of the very people who brandished liberty as the new banner of civilization. All men are created equal was just ink on paper. American President Thomas Jefferson will not recognize this young nation even though he had wished for their victory against Bonaparte and had even sold weapons and cannons to the rebels during their fierce struggle. 
he will seek to isolate Haiti, which thus, from its conception, was brutalized and oppressed. He knew full well that the Louisiana Purchase would not have been possible without the spilled blood of Haitians.